Hello, uh, my name is Andrew Simpson. Uh, welcome to this session where I'm going to give you a bit of an introduction to open science and open access, some of the uh, issues behind it and some of the different types of open access that you might find and um, uh, give you a few pointers as well to the wider debates about what is a really quite significant uh, area of, of development in kind of research practice at the moment. Um, I'm going to start by focusing on open access, which is um, which you may have heard of, is is really refers to the openness of publications. So traditionally, journals were published in print format. Um, the way they would happen is researchers would submit articles to a journal. Uh, the journal would organise peer reviews. They would send the article to two or three peer reviewers to um, comment and, and make amendments. Publishers that would then publish their set of articles in regular issues of a journal, and the way the researchers would then get access to that content is uh, by reading those physical journals. So, in most cases, it, it was about uh, the library, university library, or uh, an institutional library wherever you were working, um, buying a subscription to that journal in order for you to then read them. So, as the uh, web came along, obviously that gave a different way potentially of, of uh, sharing uh, findings and sharing new scientific research. Um, so really what I'm going to focus on is, you know, how, how has it changed and what are the different routes to finding this sort of uh, original research online? Really it divides into kind of uh, two, two categories. There is uh, free and open stuff available on the web and there are different categories of that that I'll chat through um, but then there is an awful lot of materials still um, available on the web but only available to those people who have paid to access it um, so in a tradition in a similar way to as traditionally happened with print journals um, they'd be made available if you bought a copy of the journal uh, buying it online instead of in print or if your library similarly uh, bought a subscription to the journal to make it available to their students and staff. Um, but if they didn't, then it would not be available to you. So I'm going to focus on those kind of closed journals first of all. Um, there, are, there are an awful lot of them. So um, the, the way to access them may be a, a personal route. There may be a personal route available that you could subscribe to the journal personally to pay a regular fee. Uh, to have access to all the issues, or you can opt to buy an individual article and they'll often give you a price for that. But most of the time, as with the old model, um, it's really through your institutional library that you would get access to it. So instead of physically coming to the library and finding the issue on the shelves, it would now be an online version of that. But um, you would need to go through some kind of authentication system. So normally entering your uh, your RCSI login for, for our university um, in order to get through to those journals. Um, so sometimes if you're on campus, then you might not need to enter your login because it would recognize that you were connected to the institution in a different way. So here's an example. The Lancet um, is one of the journals that we subscribe to. So uh, if you get to it in the right way and not talk about that a little bit later, um, you may well see that, uh, some sort of acknowledgement there, some sort of vision that shows you why it's letting you into the full uh, full content of the journal. Um, so in, in the Lancet's case, it has a, has a little um, note there to say to say that it's, it's the reason you're getting in is because the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland are paying for you to get in, basically. But sometimes you'll come across this sort of uh, situation where you click on a, an article that you've found online and you want to get access to it and it presents you with a whole set of options, uh, including purchasing the article for $41 in this case. Um, if you come to this sort of uh, situation, um, please don't use the logins that it presents. It does give you an option for institutional access and uh, 
uh, but my account option and so on. So basically from an RCSI point of view, the, the way that we authenticate, the way that we get you into online journals that we've bought is not through uh, either of these routes. So you will need to, if you come across this sort of uh, page, go back to the RCSI library site and uh, make a note of the journal and the issue and the article that you're after and access it through a different route. So basically our our method of, of uh, getting you into the journals very much relies on you starting from the RCSI library website and using our links. Otherwise, it won't realize that you're anything to do with RCSI and so you won't be able to get into to the article. Just to note that uh, I'll, I'll show you how to check those in a moment, but um, the option there to purchase the article, obviously that's up to you if you want to, but the, um, we do buy an awful lot of journals for you from RCSI, so don't do not do that without checking whether, whether you do have access. But even if we don't have uh, an institutional subscription for the particular journal you're trying to get into, we do have some document delivery uh, options ourselves. So yeah, they do, there is a cost to them, but it's uh, likely to be cheaper than, than buying it directly from the publisher. Um, so do, do contact the library if you come across that sort of situation. Here's the first route in to see what journals you can get into with RCSI. So this is our e-journal portal. Um, it's basically an A to Z listing of all the journals that we subscribe to. So um, if you uh, know the name of the journal, if you've come across that kind of uh, window that we just saw, you can just look up by the name of the journal. So you'd look up L for Lancet or N for New England Journal of Medicine and see whether we have access, and if so, which years we have access to. So this is this is our e-journal portal. We do have a second listing of, of the journals, which is this one called Browsing. It's basically just a little bit more uh, structured in a different way. It's, it's, it's a better one for browsing to see what journals we have in different subject areas. So um, the 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 content of it is exactly the same as the e-journal portal so from that point of view it doesn't matter which one you use you might have a personal preference if you've tried them both um but um in in general i'd say the e-journal portal is good for you know if you just know exactly what you're after and need to look up a title but if you're more interested in kind of browsing different journals and seeing what content they have uh, browsing is very good there is a third way into the journals that rcsi has and that's through uh, through searching the databases. So you'll have seen the session with uh, Niall three weeks ago now. We demonstrated some of the searching that you can do in um, the bibliographic databases that we subscribe to. So things like Medline and Embase and CINAHL. So here's an example of, of a reference from one of those databases. This is from EBSCO CINAHL. And you'll find that there is uh, a link there. So down at the bottom here in purple, it says full text RCSI question mark. Um, so a lot of the journals, a lot of the databases, sorry, will will have a direct link through to the full text that we buy. So they try and tie the reference that you're getting from the database to the actual full article. So if, you, if you've gone in through the RCSI library, library website to one of our databases, they'll, they'll uh, be some sort of link to get you to the e-journals. So you don't necessarily, for every reference, you don't have to go out to the e-journal portal and look it up. It should give you that direct link. Obviously, in this case, you've also got a PDF full text link directly there, so uh, which is an even easier option. Um, but you should find a, a full text RCSI link in most databases for, for, for um, all the references to, to check against the e-journal portal. Um, so I've, I've outlined three different ways to check the e at RCSI. Um, they, you can get into all of those routes from this page, which is the LibGuides A to Z resources page. So the A to Z resources are the kind of search engines, the databases themselves, like Medline and Embase. Uh, but then on the right hand side here, you'll see there's also links to the eJournal portal, which is the first one I showed you to look up the name of a journal and browsing is an alternative way of doing that or for browsing for particular journal titles. So you can get a link to all of them from, from this page. 
So closed journals totally depends on uh, paying for the content, but in most cases, you know what 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 you need good selection of what you need is being paid for by RCSI, and so these routes will get you into that content. But there's an increasing amount of free stuff available on the web, uh, open material, open access material, it tends to be called, uh, which anyone can access. Not hard to find. Google will do the job for this kind of content, but it does break down into different categories, and uh, I think it's worth understanding what it is that you that you might find. So I'm just going to go through these four categories now. So the first uh, open access publishers, sometimes called gold open access. These are new publishers in the kind of web age, uh, so uh, titles that didn't exist in print before, but are now uh, uh, an, an, an online journal making access for anybody to access it online, no barriers at all, free to anybody. Uh, so a couple of examples of uh, BMC, which stands for Biomed Central, and PLOT is the Public Library of Science, which is a US-based one. Basically, they've they've made it their mission to just uh, to make a large amount of material available. It goes through peer reviews. So it's quality controlled in exactly the same way as if it was in one of the traditional publishers. Um, but they um, are making it available to you. The way they fund that is to charge the author instead of uh, the reader. So you're being charged to publish. Um, instead of being charged to read it. So, you know, in most cases, the, the authors will be tied to an institution which may have funds to pay or may uh, have funding from a research funder to help pay. Um, but the important thing from an uh, access point of view is it's there for anyone. So here's the couple of examples that I spoke about in their kind of flagship uh, general medicine journals, BMC Medicine and PLOS One, uh, where you can have a look now and, and you'll get into to lots of content. And it's the same type of content that you'd find in BMJ or New England Journal of Medicine or whatever. It's, it's peer-reviewed uh, articles in the same way. The second category of called hybrid publishers. This is really the traditional journals that we spoke about at the beginning, closed, closed journals, if you like. But they, uh, a lot of them now also allow uh, individual articles to be published as, a, as if they were gold open access, i.e. they let the author pay to make it freely available to anyone. So this has become a, you know, an increasing uh, market, if you like. Uh, the author pays a fee, the same as for PLOS One, say, or for the BMC. Uh, but you're paying it instead to, say, The Lancet or, or a, another specialist journal um, to the article available. Slightly different uh, route to that because you may be accepted by the journal first, and then you may have the option of whether you want to pay extra to make it available for free to everyone or whether you just get it published behind a paywall as, as for the closed journals. It's slightly controversial in some circles just because uh, from an institutional point of view we, we're paying a subscription to access content for you but then some of that content we're paying for our uh, research to make it available to everyone so there's kind of a, a, an issue in terms of whether whether that's fair and whether the uh, you know whether you're paying for uh, less content uh, whether you're paying the publisher twice and so on so it's a kind of uh, controversial area but the, in terms of how how it's seen in the research world we spoke last week if you've uh, attended my talk on on citations and understanding their role in research um, if not you can watch the recording of it but you know the, the role of citations in research is still very strong and there is a, a good body of evidence to that you know, paying for access for your article in this sort of situation really does mean more people read it and more people cite it, and therefore your kind of metrics may well go up. Um, so just the final bullet there, just to point out that sometimes individual articles, uh, the journal may decide to make some articles available. Sometimes they just make some available for a limited uh, time, either because it's a kind of uh, uh, an important 
popular topic or they just want to kind of get more people into reading the, the content so that to encourage them to subscribe so it's sometimes called bronze open access but it's basically you know it may be that nobody's paid for it to be made available but it there so so sometimes you'll see content that you won't necessarily know whether it's somebody's paid for to make it available or whether the publishers just decided to do an occasional article like this um so just an example of this so this is the lancet child and adolescent health journal and so you know this is the sort of thing you'll see a uh, list of list of articles and the top one there is is labeled in orange as open access the others the others aren't so likely you'll have to log in to be able to get to into the full text of the second two but anybody would be able to get into the first one so the third category is repositories so repositories um have uh, cropped up in in different situations generally they're either focused around a particular subject area or about a particular institution so um and really what they're seeking to do there's no payments involved it's about making papers available free that they're allowed to make freely available so uh, you get various sorts of repository rcsi has its own repository that i'll show you in a moment um, making the papers written by people from rcsi freely available wherever we're allowed to um, but there are other examples there so Open Air is, is an EU uh, gateway. RIAN is a national one. Venice uh, makes a lot of uh, material from the HSC available. And then you get kind of ones that specialize in, in material beyond publication. So Sonodo uh, has various material, but especially in terms of uh, research data that I'll, I'll mention again later. So Here's the uh, screenshot just to the RCSI's repository, which is just a little that URL. So we try and share um, material written by RCSI staff to make it freely available to, to everyone wherever we can. So the issue with repositories really is, is what can you share? So very often repository uh, papers won't will be a version of a paper, but we won't necessarily be able to share the final published version uh, of of a particular article. But you may get the same text, or you may get a pre uh, pre um, peer reviewed version of that. So when you go through a publishing process, generally publishers will get the authors to sign um, an agreement. Um, giving the publisher rights to uh, the copyright on on the final article. So this is uh, one of the norms I've written there being challenged by Plan S, which is one of the open access kind of um, initiatives being taken by a number of funders across Europe. Um, so it is something coming under a little bit of strain, but in general, this is this is the kind of uh, what has been the norm for a long time. So really, to be able to share your article on the RCSI repository as an RCSI author, it depends what your publisher says. You, you, you won't necessarily be able to just do that. Yourself. So we do have some guidance around this. And I was just going to talk through the kind of stages to just understand, because basically, there, are, in general, there are three uh, versions of an article that might exist. And it depends on the publisher, what you're allowed to share through a repository. Uh, such as RCSI repository. So, you know, here's here's what would happen. You do your research, you write it up, you draft an article and you try and find a journal to submit that to. So uh, in submitting it to a journal, you're you're sending what is sometimes called the preprint uh, or the, the uh, kind of original manuscript. The journal will look at it. If they like the look of it, they'll send it to their peer reviewers for, for review. The reviewers would give their comments and you'll get an outcome from that so it could be that they just accept it and that's fine and they go ahead with publication it could be that they reject it and say it's not right for the journal or it's not good enough in some way in which case uh, you'd go back to an earlier step of looking for another journal or or trying to revise the uh, the article in some way it may be that they just have, which is probably the most common one, they, they have some revisions and suggestions for how you change it. So it goes around peer review again. 
uh, for people to look at the revisions. But basically, you've now got a, once the peer reviewers are happy and the manuscript is accepted, you have a second version. Moving on from the preprint, we've got the postprint or the accepted manuscript. So that's that's then the final text. The text isn't going to change, um, but it's still in just a kind of general word document or similar uh, format. What the publisher would then do is do some final kind of tidying and type scripting and uh, formatting and, and so on to make it look pretty and to have it in the right format they want for their journal and then they would publish it. So you then get a third version which is the publisher version, the version of record sometimes called, it's the one that actually appears in the journal. So when we're talking about repositories and preprints and postprints, uh, it varies depending on the publisher what you can put into a repository. So we encourage RCSI authors to put whatever they can in, in the repository and we would help them work out, uh, depending on which journal they're publishing in, what, what we're allowed to do. Um, but very often um, it, would, it wouldn't be the version of record, it wouldn't be the publisher version unless that's been made freely available for everyone anyway. Um, it would more often be the print. Um, generally speaking, you can always share the preprint, that first version that you submit to, to uh, possibly multiple journals is generally yours, um, but the postprint, obviously the postprint would be after peer review, so it's a slightly more finished version of the text, um, which repositories would be uh, keen to, to share, and certainly from an RCSI point of view, we're keen to get as much into the repository as we can. The fourth category of open that I started with there was uh, preprints. So hopefully you now understand what preprints are. They're the, the original manuscript before peer review, just what you've drafted or what the group of you have drafted as your text. Um, there are some specialist preprint servers out there that share these uh, pre-peer reviewed kind of um, Articles. So, R is the most uh, long established one. It's maybe not so relevant from a subject point of view. It's kind of maths and physics and computer science, but it's been there for probably 30 years or more now. Um, and this is quite well established in the physics world as, as the way that people share their latest research. Most of it would then be published in a final format in a journal somewhere they're um, quite well attuned to sharing their initial versions and kind of using that in, in to inform their own research. Sharing the preprint, obviously there is, it hasn't been through peer, peer review, it's just the yeah, original manuscript, so it's not at the same level of checks, but it can be really useful. You know, we've seen a lot of use of preprints in the last few months with uh, COVID, so, you know, it's a way of getting your research out very quickly to, to a community and there are preprints servers that kind of focus on different subject areas. So I mentioned their med archive, there's also a bio archive uh, where people can share their, their you know, their preprints, original uh, manuscripts. Um, normally, as I say, you would then go on to publish it somewhere, but it's, it's a good way of sharing it. I've just mentioned there, I'll maybe just show you Europe PMC is another very useful site. It really brings together some of those preprint archives. So Med Archive and Biomed Archive both feed in, uh, includes content from um, both of those, but it also includes uh, PubMed and all the abstracts from PubMed, but also uh, a number of published uh, uh, postprint and, and published version articles as well. So it's quite a useful gateway into kind of the mix of uh, peer-reviewed and non-peer-reviewed content. Let's go back to my presentation. So um, just to kind of summarise finding open events, just bear in mind that there are there may be different versions out there. So when you come across a paywall like that, you can obviously go and check whether the particular e-journal is available from RCSI. But even if it's not, it may be that a uh, uh, in particular, a preprint or a postprint version of the article, maybe on a repository somewhere, you wouldn't get the automatic link to that, generally speaking, from the database. Some of them are starting to do that, but you wouldn't assume that. So searching for the exact title of the article you're after on Google 
which you might think to do anyway, it's quite a good approach to just double check that kind of repository or preprint content because it will normally uh, work well at finding it in whatever repository it's in. They're all quite well integrated into Google. So it is, uh, if, you, if you're searching for a, a particular uh, article and, and you don't think that RCSI has a subscription to that particular journal, then Google is, is worth doing as uh, putting the article title. Um, bear in mind that sometimes the repository content can be embargoed. So I mentioned that we're reliant on publishers um, to allow us to put content onto the repository. Sometimes what they say is uh, you can you can share the post print version of an article, but only 12 months or six months after it's been published in the journal, i.e. they want a kind of window where people can only access it on their on their own site and therefore pay for it. Um, but then after a certain amount of time has passed, they allow you to um, to host it on the repository. So uh, sometimes you may cross an article that's in a repository, but it says embargoed, or it, it doesn't give the full text of the article, and that may be why. Um, so, and yes, final message, which I've, I've given already really, of the published version may well be behind a paywall, but make sure you do use links. If you've searched on Google, and the Google, Google gives you a link to a, a publisher site that you hadn't found before, it's worth going and, and checking the eJournals portal or uh, browsing on, on RCSI library for that journal to see whether you are entitled to that. I'm just going to give uh, a couple of words about the kind of broader movement. I focus quite a lot and talk about some of the practicalities of how you find content and, and the different sorts of content that you might be looking at. But really, the open access movement has been going for kind of 20 years or so and is quite a major. Uh, challenge to, I guess, the research um, kind of process and how, how things, uh, how research is conducted, really. Um, and increasingly, funders are, uh, are the ones uh, pressing for further change. So, a number of our funders in Ireland, as well as the EU, has led uh, a lot of the time in, in the last few years on increasing um, the need for uh, openness in, in research findings. So, the, you know, the basic logic being that um, the funders tend to be from the public sector, they're paid by the taxpayer, and the taxpayer's funded research is then, uh, if it's then made uh, available only through uh, payments, then where's, where's the logic in that is the kind of basic argument that if taxpayers have paid for it, taxpayers should be able to read the outcomes. And so there is a, a, a ratcheting up, really, of, of the strictness of requirements from various uh, funders to say, if you uh, publish uh, findings from your funded research, then we expect them to be freely available for everyone. Uh, Plan S is really the most significant uh, initiative in the last couple of years. So you have a whole set of new requirements that will come in from the beginning of 2021. Uh, you can read about it there, but it's caused a bit of a uh, fuss or a controversy within uh, the publishing world and how they uh, respond to that. Um, so uh, it's it's still a moving uh, moving thing, but um, it's certainly the the direction of travel is clear that op open access is kind of becoming more and more required by funders. Uh, funders are also starting to look beyond just published uh, research to other materials produced as, uh, as as part of doing the research. So data is the kind of most prominent one of, of those. So I just wanted to mention um, what they tend to call fair data. So um, open openness in uh, sharing the, the data that you produce as part of your experiments or part of your uh, research. The, it's, it's legitimate to say that there are uh, many cases where you couldn't necessarily just openly share the data. You know, depends on the topic of your research and who you've spoken to and so on. But there are often issues with confidentiality or commercial issues or something like that, which mean people don't want to fully share all the data that they've produced as part of their research, at least not initially. 
So this acronym FAIR is starting to be used to, in connection with data, which stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And really it's trying to make the focus, uh, the focus is, is uh, allowing data to be to be reused to its maximum. So it may be that you can't share absolutely everything, but it may be that you can share a version of the data or you can uh, hold back some of the uh, metadata, some of the information around it, um, but still allow it to be um, used to some extent, even as a minimum sharing the fact that that data exists and just a description of the data may be a help to other people doing research in that area just to know that data sets exist maybe they would uh, you know you could come to an agreement for sharing them so there's there's a, a whole uh, huge industry really building up around this around setting up the structures and the processes and the skills needed to um, try and conduct research in a way that makes it easy to then share data as much as possible at the end um, so that funders can get the most out of research that they've funded. They don't want to create research that uh, just produces one one or two journal articles and then is is dead if the data can be reused you know in unpredictable ways um, or reused by others who were involved in that initial research that try and make sure the maximum is made of it basically. So we have some information on our LibGuides research support guide about um, research data management and fair data. It's a growing area, so it will be something that if you kind of go into research more, will certainly be uh, a topic that you'll come across. More broadly, there's uh, what's referred to and used in the title of the talk, open science, it's sometimes referred to as open scholarship, a kind of movement to just be more open about everything. Uh, to do with the research process. So it could be uh, being open about uh, peer review decisions and comments. It could be to do with, um, you know, how how research is being conducted, sharing results along the way during the research, uh, involving the public in research in different ways. So there's a whole set of strands of, of uh, a drive towards more openness, you know, with, with the logic uh, of um, it being taxpayer funded and, and there being a kind of good to being being open about it, but also in terms of kind of research integrity and the ability to double check uh, results, to validate, uh, to collaborate and so on. It just um, a greater openness is, is really uh, just another way to, to make more of the research that's being done. So we have less uh, kind of um, uh, repetition, I guess, of, of people redoing things that they either didn't know had been redone or didn't have the kind of uh, detailed outputs they, they would, would have needed to, to reuse. There's various stuff you can read about this. It's, uh, there's a whole uh, kind of set of initiatives from different organisations around it. I've just mentioned a few there. If you are interested, Foster Open Science is quite a good site just because it has various training materials around this as well that you could explore. Um, but you know it is a topic within Ireland as well. There's a there's a national group that's uh, trying to drive forward various initiatives to do with openness in in, in research generally. And just to finish with, I'm going back to kind of more focus on publications, the 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 are various arguments in terms of the principles of openness, but it also pays off in terms of citation. So again, referring back to my talk last week on on the importance of of all the ways that citations are, are used within um, the research uh, process and research assessment and so on. Um, there's, there's a number of articles that have kind of looked at the performance of open access um, articles versus closed articles and uh, it's fairly uh, clear that in general obviously there's variation depending on uh, individual articles but in general they, they do perform um, much better in terms of being cited. It makes sense. More people will read it if it's openly available and they're more likely to cite it if they've read it. Um, but I looked at this quite recently just at our own RCSI publications. So the graph just shows the number of the bars and the number of publications total and the number of open access ones over the last 10 years. And the 
proportion there has been growing of, of the number of them that are available freely on the on the web it's up to around 40 percent now um but equally i had a look at the uh, citation performance of, of those two sets of data so you know 11 citations on average for those that are openly available compared to uh, under five for those that were closed again that's an average depends on you know how many citations you get depends on a number of things and how much you uh, publicize the paper and how you uh, reference it at conferences and, and all sorts of things um, but you know I think uh, the average is, is quite a stark uh, contrast between the two so I um, just thought I would throw that in as, as, as an illustration of, of uh, the value of, of being open. Um, what I haven't touched on too much is some of the more general kind of arguments around open access and, and the uh, its value and the to the research process and to researchers themselves. There's, so I've just pointed you to three videos here. There's, there's more available. You won't struggle to find them, I'm sure. So the top one is, is uh, just a, a short, I think it's eight minutes or something, uh, explanation of the, the publishing model really and, and how publishing was done and the researcher role in it and, and why open access came about and what it's seeking to uh, overcome. The second one is a TED talk from uh, an, a PhD, uh, recent PhD, I think, um, and her struggles with the kind of uh, research process and the pressure on researchers to publish and, and some of the difficulties that, that uh, around that and uh, with uh, the role of citations. So it touches on some of the themes I I was talking about last week, uh, but also kind of how openness uh, could help with that. So I recommend that it's, it's a kind of very uh, personal kind of uh, take on it. Uh, and again, it's not too long. I think it's 12 or 13 minutes. The final one is a, is a longer thing. It's about an hour long, but you can easily dip in and out of it. Um, but it was a film made by uh, an academic in, I think he's in New York, so in the US, um, looking at the kind of history of the publishing industry and some of the publishers uh, and you know the um, resistance to change I guess as, as, it, as publishing moved to the to the web and, and the reason reasons why open access is kind of um, is a better use of research funding and so on so uh, that one's also available through our through our libguide but um, uh, do do have a dip into those for a kind of fuller uh, take on the the arguments around around open access, the reasons for open access, which I haven't gone into too much in this talk. Just a reminder: sport always available. Um, we have some uh, information about open access publishing on our re on our research sport web guide. Um, we have guidance on the repository itself, uh, but obviously always happy to take queries on this sort of thing. Um, just contact the library or contact me, Andrew Simpson. But um, we're, we're always happy to uh, try and try and help or answer queries around around accessing uh, material or all the issues around that. Um, so thank you very much.